this is a module, part of a course. It's approximately 25% of a graduate class in qualitative social science. Um, and we made this class uh, for several reasons. One, because we could not accommodate the number of students who wanted to enroll in the class, and because beyond those who enroll in the class, there are always people ranging from undergraduates to members of the staff and faculty as well who will show up at one of our offices in anthropology and say, could you tell me how to do ethnography? And, and often, one of the largest cohorts is from D-Lab, and they will come by and say, well, I'm going to Tanzania, and somebody told me I should talk to an anthropologist. And I would say, so uh, yeah, one of my colleagues has written a whole book about Tanzania and working there for several years. Uh, when are you leaving? Next week. And uh, these were very frustrating events. Uh, and very frustrating even not for the undergraduate who is going off to do something for which they're totally unprepared. Um, but for people who want to do research and they think that interviewing is an easy way to collect data and it became burdensome. So we decided maybe we could get rid of some of the people by doing this. <laughs> now, um, so what are our specific goals is as, that we didn't want to just give a technique because it's meaningless if you don't understand why you're doing it and what you're trying to achieve. So what we try to show in this module is what the criteria are for qualitative social science. Because most people, or many people, especially people who are not social scientists, when I, have, I do have not a small number of engineers who take these classes, they are always talking about objectivity and bias. These seem to be their favorite words. And they think if the researcher is the tool for data collection, then there is no such thing as objective disinterest. Well, they say unbiased, but I try to point out disinterest is not the same as unbiased. I have no interest in the outcome does not mean that somebody else wouldn't collect something different. That, anyway. So the point of the first part of the class is to show what the difference is of the module is to explain the differences between quantitative and qualitative research and to show that we do in fact have criteria that, uh, that we try to meet for validity. And uh, we go through all of these. And then we wanted to locate conversational interviewing as one of the many techniques that are used in field work and to describe the technique just for interviewing. So the, the, the we shouldn't call it course because it's module, but the, the syllabus starts with what is social science? How does social science differ from the physical sciences? And I make a major point of saying that to call something science means not that it has to be quantitative or reduced to numbers, but that the method of collecting the information and the method of analyzing it must be transparent to an audience so that the audience can assess the, the results. So you have to make transparent the basis of your claim to knowledge. And that's what constitutes science, and that's what we try to show in these techniques. So then qualitative research differs from quantitative research because you're not asking the same question, how much. You're, not, you're often not asking a causal question. For the most part, qualitative research is what does it mean? What does it signify to the actor? Which is a different question than you ask with survey research, though people think that's what they're asking on survey research. That's not what they're getting. And so we explain what field work is and then conversational interviewing within field work. So we start so with a big question and we get down to a narrower question, which is the focus of this module. 
And then I explain how you establish validity and validi what the criteria are, that it has to be descriptive validity, anybody who has been or observed or participated in the scene would describe it exactly the same way. It has to have interpretive validity. That is, what does that description signify to the actors in the room, which is validated by the description? And the third level of validity is theoretical. What does it mean to we, the observers, within the repertoire of social theories, which say what this is an example of within such larger category. And then there can be generalizability and uh, normative. Okay, These are five different criteria for assessing the work, and they can be tested by reference to ob observ observational information. Okay, So now we get, after we do the first three framing topics, we get to what they came here for, which is how to conduct an interview. And we explain what the purpose is, not for you, the interviewer, to be imposing a, uh, a set of outcomes or desires, but in fact to create an environment in which the person being interviewed will reveal to you their experience, experiences, so that you can analyze that, which will be our next module, to figure out what it means to that actor. And you don't get that by saying, what does this mean to you? That doesn't work, okay? All right, so what we show is how to draft an interview protocol, which is a set of questions, which invite the interviewee to tell you stories about events or work or location, depends what you're studying. And as they tell you these stories, this is all recorded, you will use the transcripts of that to analyze the meaning for these actors. The, what is descriptive validity, which comes from everybody agreeing what happened, is produced by the transcript. So you don't have to worry about that it then moves on to the analysis. And what we provide in the module are examples of good and bad interviews. We started this project a long time ago, and the anthropology department, and we conducted and filmed these good and bad interviews, and then we got stuck. We didn't know how to make a module. We didn't know how to use the technology, and very generously, uh, that gave us Megan to do this. Okay, <laughs> and now, so now it's up to. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, so I just wanted to give you a sense of who's taking this course and also sort of a little bit of a, a sense of how we did this on the platform. Uh, so we have almost 6,000 students, uh, 164 countries today. We were surprised that a, a lot of our students are from developing countries and doing research for NGOs or universities, a lot of people in refugee camps. Um, so it seems like there's a big hunger for this kind of uh, research methodology kind of training. So we're excited to get this out there in the next module as well. Um, it's a pretty young group of students, median age 33. We have almost gender parity, which is pretty unique for an MIT course. Um, it's a highly educated group of people, which makes sense because they're doing research. Um, okay, so this is the students and then what we did. So I really wanted to talk about this in this talk today because I'm frequently asked in these kinds of uh, SIG event luncheons and, and open learning uh, how we're able to do humanities, re or humanities classes on the edX platform, um, given that it's really set up for more of sort of math, biology, environment, where there's a clear yes or no answers. And in our assessments, there's very rarely uh, a, like a, a correct answer. And we don't want to imply that there is, because it's really a lot more complicated. Um, and it's really about forming arguments and proving the logic behind your thinking with data um, than a simple yes or no. So in this course, we wanted to employ these kind of worked examples. Since we're teaching a methodology, we want to give the students an idea of the problems that researchers face and how they solve them, and give them a scaffolding for thinking about and unpacking these problems. Um, 
So we had to be kind of creative in doing this. So this is sort of an example of a hack that we employed. Um, so this is the multiple choice question that you know, but when we use it, we actually have both answers are correct. Uh, we give the students a prompt, and then we explain in the answer session uh, section what we think is the right answer and why, um, and what we think is the wrong answer and why. But then underneath this section, we actually have a discussion area where we invite the students to reflect on this exercise, and if they disagreed with us, to give evidence for why they disagreed, um, and just to sort of provide their thinking. So then we can also see where the students are at and how they're actually uh, uh, taking in this information. So a second example is uh, we use this annotation tool uh, we got from Harvard and it's LTI'd into the platform. Um, with this one, so the annotation tool usually, you know, the students would be able to annotate text, see each other's questions or comments and then co communicate with each other in those text boxes. But we actually turned all the social components off in this module um, because we wanted, we didn't want to distract the students um, from the material. So here's where they're actually identifying validity in this introduction chapter um, of a book by a professor at MIT. And she's really employing data to talk about these, to really meet these different standards of validity. So we present the students this chapter and ask them to identify the different kinds of validity and explain what they are and, and how the author is addressing them. And then they're able to then toggle to my notes where I've gone in and and written where we think that this validity is showing up and why. Um, so they can kind of go back and forth. Um, and then we do a similar tactic using the same annotation tool with the social elements turned off. When they're drafting interview protocols, uh, we give them two examples of interview protocols, one that is in okay shape and one that is in rough shape. Um, and then we do the same thing. So they're, First, they see this as a blank interview protocol, and we ask them to edit it, to propose better, sec better questions or reframe the questions if it's appropriate. And then they're able to see the questions and notes that I've made on both. Um, and then as Susan noted, we also did this with the interview itself by filming the interviewer and the interviewee, and the students watch short sections of the interview and are asked to assess it, and then they get to see Susan's assessment of the same uh, clip. So those worked examples were obviously not graded because it would be impossible to grade them. Uh, but the way that we did grade is through uh, these open response assessments, where we then, once the students have practiced annotating with, with sort of my feedback, then they annotate uh, and edit each other's interview protocols that they've drafted. And then they go out and conduct interviews themselves and give each other feedback on um, how they have to write a reflection of how the interview went. So that is the course. And we're using the same tactics in the next module, which we're working on now. It's so happy to take any questions.